Uh, we are on the second day of the special online course that is advances in remote sensing techniques for geological applications. And uh, see, today we have two sessions. In the first session, we'll discuss on advances in thermal and micro remote sensing for geological studies. And in the second session, we'll, there is uh, uh, lecture on the remote sensing applications in engineering geology and highlighting the recent advances that will be delivered by Dr. Somola Chaturaj. So in the first session, uh, advances in thermal and microwave remote sensing for geological applications. So see in thermal remote sensing, the spectral region, as we discussed yesterday also, that three to 35 micrometer is the thermal infrared region uh, for this terrestrial remote sensing. Uh, out of these, this uh, total region of three to 35 micrometer for uh, a geological uh, interest, you see eight to 14 micrometer is very, very popular and it is widely used. There are certain reasons for that. See, why that at ambient temperature of the earth surface, the, the, that is uh, 25 degrees Celsius, the peak of the earth's black body radiation, it occurs at 9.7. So where the maximum radiation peak occurs, so one should sense thermally in and around that particular wavelength. Nine to ten, you avoid because you get uh, the sufficient thermal radiation because it is obstructed by the ozone layer. Another important point: to five micrometer, there are some solar reflectance. So that is the reason. Uh, if you do thermal sensing during daytime, then of the reflectance. <clears throat> so. Uh, it is advisable or rather it is recommended that you always use three to five micrometer during night time only. Night time means pre-dawn is most important in that this your differential the topographic elevations will be nullified. Now see this is very good. Uh, see in case of uh, sun the solar radiation spectrum is like this. Top of the atmosphere is like yellow and why the difference? The difference because of the absorption by the atmospheric gases and the uh, these aerosol particles. Is it? Now you see that the top of the atmosphere solar spectrum and this black body radiation spectrum at 5,250 degrees Celsius, 5 to 50 degrees Celsius, you see they are comparable. You can consider that the temperature of the sun is like this Celsius. Is it? But here the most important thing to understand that the maximum radiation of the sun is happening where is in this region. This 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 micrometer, isn't it? It is around 0 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. Uh, it is this total solar radiation happens in this visible region. And the maximum radiation peak wavelength is at 0.5. Whereas in case of the earth, it is around 10 micrometer. Precisely 9.7, as we discussed in the previous slide, isn't it? So thermal sensing of the sun should be done in and around 0.5 micrometer, whereas thermal sensing of the earth should be done in and around 10 micrometer. Is it where the maximum radiation peak occurs? <clears throat> now, the Planck's law, the basis of a thermal remote sensing that we discussed yesterday, that it relates three variables. What are they? What is the temperature of the object? Okay, that is T. And uh, how much radiation it does and in a particular wavelength, or that the maximum uh, radiation peak wavelength. So, this is L lambda, spectral radiance, and the, the lambda is the wavelength of the maximum radiation peak. So it is the relation between these three. Other things you see, like phi, it is a known value. H is a Planck's constant, and K is Boltzmann constant, isn't it? So from that, okay, if you can sense from satellite or aircraft or from any sensor, if you can sense how much spectral radiation is happening, or what is the emitted energy from the object. So from the emitted energy, in and around a particular wavelength, like L lambda or spectral radiance, if you have, from that you can calculate the temperature T because you know what is the maximum radiation peak wavelength. Okay. Now in uh, thermal remote sensing, there are certain thermal, uh, these your parameters or these physical properties of thermal remote sensing that we discussed yesterday as well. Thermal conductivity, density, thermal capacity, thermal diffusivity, and thermal inertia. A thermal inertia is a very sensitive parameter. And uh, because of its sensitivity, you can differentiate well different rock types using thermal inertia. Now see what is the formula of thermal inertia. It is the square root of K, rho, and C. 
AK is thermal conductivity, rho is density of the material, and C is the specific heat. Rho C together is the heat capacity or heat storage capacity. Okay, but this is uh, is a very cumbersome parameter, no thermal inertia. If you want to get it, you have to measure in the laboratory. Okay, and that is a cumbersome process. But by remote sensing based, this process, you can get the thermal inertia, which is very close to this P, not exactly the same. And that is known as apparent thermal inertia. Now, try to understand what is the philosophy of the thermal inertia. The philosophy is the resistance to temperature change. Isn't it? Is in an analogy to the moment of inertia. So if some heat is supplied to the object, then its resistance to temperature change, if it is high, then its thermal inertia is high. If its resistance to temperature change is low, then its thermal inertia is low. Or if you extract, extract heat from the object, okay, if its resistance to temperature uh, this change, that is temperature is going down, if it is high, then its thermal inertia is high and the vice versa. Okay, now, so if the temperature change is one of the important parameter and what is the total heat is supplied to the object, isn't it? Now see for the earth features, where from the heat you are getting? Heat you are getting from the sun. But the total energy, if we consider total fraction is one. So if you subtract the reflectance value, the reflected energy you are subtracting, then what remains? Transmitted energy and absorbed energy. So one minus A, sorry. So one minus A, basically it tells you how much this your solar radiation is, is it goes inside the material, inside the earth materials, isn't it? One minus A. So that is the energy which is going inside this material. So that will cause the temperature change. Now, what is the temperature change? This is the total energy supply to the this uh, terrestrial object. And what is the temperature change? So for that you need, what is the daytime temperature? Midday and noon temperature. And what is the nighttime temperature? So delta T. So if you have delta T and if you have the reflectance, then you can get the thermal inertia, isn't it? A reflectance you can get from any, this your panchromatic image which covers the this visible range 0.4 to 0.7 okay where the maximum reflection happens and delta t you can get from the uh, there are uh, the thermal missions like modis like uh, NOAA, iv hrr where you have uh, this uh, one daytime uh, orbit over the earth and the nighttime in fact in case of modis you have two temperatures in fact four temperatures during daytime there are two temperatures you can get from what is data and night and two temperatures you can get. So you need one midday and one midnight. So from midday and midnight temperature, you can get delta T and you can easily get the apparent thermal inertia. Isn't it? <clears throat> now you see, depending on the thermal inertia, the object will in the night time, object can have high temperature if its thermal inertia is high and uh, or the object will have low temperature if its thermal inertia is low. Because during daytime, all objects will have higher temperature because there are a lot of solar uh, radiation has been received, isn't it? During the daytime, all objects, they are becoming heat. And, uh, they are heated, so they are hot, no? So daytime temperature is high, but during night time, if its thermal inertia is low, then what will happen? The temperature will cool down very easily, so it will be cold. And if thermal inertia is high, then your temperature will be high, okay? So then some features will be uh, your cold and some features will be hot during night time. Now, if you have a false color composite image which covers longer wavelength, medium wavelength, and shorter wavelength, then what will happen? If the temperature of the object is high, then what will happen? Maximum radiation will take place in the shorter wavelength. If the temperature of the object is low, that means it's a colder object, then the maximum radiation will happen in the longer wavelength. Depending on that, if you assign the color red to the longer wavelength, so the object which is cold will appear in the uh, red. You see here this alluvium or the loose materials, those have low thermal inertia, isn't it? So they are all uh, look red. Why? Because colder objects. Whereas the one you have assigned blue color, at three is green, one is shorter wavelength. Now the object in the night time, for example, these they are compact rocks, very hard, compact, very heavy, isn't it? So because of that, its thermal inertia is very high. So when thermal inertia is very high, this object 
there is daytime temperature was high during night time also it is not cooling down easily so its temperature during night time is also high okay so that is why if the temperature is high then its maximum radiation will take place in the shorter wavelength so it will look blue and that is what is happening and in case of water also you see water because of its uh, thermal property okay so it does not cool down very easily okay its diffusivity is very low okay so that is the reason water will also relatively it will uh, be warmer during night time so that is why it looks blue similarly in this particular example see the lava flows at uh, different times older lava flows will be cold and younger lava flows or fresh lava flows will be hot so if you assign this similarly red green and blue color for fcc 531 then what will happen for uh, for 5 you have assigned red color so and five minutes longer wavelength isn't it so that means colder object will look red and one is shorter wavelength so hot object will look blue so that means blue color uh, these lava flows are the phase lava flows younger lava flows and red color uh, these lava flows are the older lava flows and this uh, green and yellow these are intermediate isn't it now we see in thermal remote sensing is a uh, very very important particularly nowadays there are a lot of advancement has happened for precise uh, your calculation precise retrieval of land surface temperature for land surface temperature you need to correct the atmospheric effect and you need to correct the emissivity effect and there are different algorithms for single uh, band this is a single channel algorithm and this is uh, one of the robust algorithms known as radiative transfer model or rtf rt n okay and uh, for the multi spectral thermal uh, sensors or uh, uh, multiple channels were available so where you have thermal bands more than one you have uh, for example in case of aster you have five is it it in case of landsat 8 and 9 tirs you have two or even modis also there are two so if there are uh, for multi spectral channels okay we use the split window algorithm depending on their that is particularly exploiting their the relative this uh, thermal emissivity and atmospheric effect okay so land surface temperature is uh, now whatever we can retrieve is very precise now after getting the land surface temperature thermal anomaly detection is another important uh, component for cool fire mapping monitoring and modeling okay so thermal anomaly detection algorithm there are different algorithms are there that uh, for example pixel integrated temperature modeling that we have uh, this uh, proposed then there is a profile based algorithm again we have proposed there are many other algorithms like statistical based algorithm histogram based algorithm so this is proposed by different groups isn't it so or uh, this is what is the uh, by varying the uh, special windows okay so that you can get the so whatever particular pixel is uh, uh, has a temperature which is different from the surrounding uh, pixels okay how much it is different from the neighboring pixels so that way we can identify uh, the particular pixel whether it is thermally anomalous or not so these are the algorithms there are a lot of advancement and you can those are interested they can uh, look into the these uh, recent research papers there are many research papers you will get from our side and from many international groups you will get okay now see in case of uh, coal fields for example in india there gondwana coal is a very high quality coal and tertiary coal are not so high quality so gondwana coal fields there are uh, 54 prominent gondwana coal fields and out of that this jheria coal field is here that is the most important coal field because it hosts the prime cooking coal okay and cooking coal is used for uh, iron and steel industry okay but unfortunately the jheria coal field is the worst affected coal field in terms of coal fire as well as by in terms of subsidence okay so for this particular coal field we have uh, been studying since 1990s even uh, up to the recently 2020 21 something like this here you can get the picture of from 1992 to 2013 and you see this surface coal fire subsurface coal fire and the total coal fire scenario of this coal field and how we did it we have first uh, retrieved the precise land surface temperature then by thermal anomaly detection algorithm we by model based algorithm 
we have identified the surface cold fire and subsurface cold fire. Okay, but from observation also you can identify very precisely the location of the surface cold fire. But for that you have to use the shorter wavelength uh, thermal channel like short wave infrared band. So here we did that and we have identified precisely the locations of the surface cold fires. Is it? And finally, you can have the mine plan as we discussed yesterday also. See it. Now, see here, this is how we have identified this uh, surface cold fire, subsurface cold fire, that is yellow, and this, the other you can find, this is the some uh, light brown color. Okay, they are the transitional, these thermally anomalous transitional areas. Okay, so that we have done first, Precise land surface temperature followed by pixel integrated temperature modeling, then profile based algorithm. Okay. And this is what I discussed in the previous slide how we identified the uh, high temperature targets. Uh, the mostly they are the surface cold fire of higher temperature, and this is relatively lesser temperature of 150 degrees Celsius and above. And there are some are high temperature pixels, those are not cold fires, so there are some other things like uh, brick uh, kilns. Okay, brick factories. Now see, in case of satellite-based thermal remote sensing, there is a problem because uh, the, your uh, spatial resolution is not very fine. It is quite coarse resolution. Okay, I'll I'll discuss about that uh, after these uh, few slides on these in situ observations. So uh, in mostly this spatial resolution, it varies from one kilometer. This is a coarse resolution one. And from medium resolution, it is 100 meter, 120 meter, 90 meter, something like this. You do not have the spatial uh, resolution of uh, some uh, few meters, like five meters, like 10 meters, or like one meters. Very high resolution pixels are not available to you. It is very uh, medium resolution means uh, 90 meter, 100 meter, something like this. But we need very precise uh, this for precise detection of the coal fire. We need very finer resolution. Uh, this your you know, land surface temperature or uh, thermal band, thermal image. So then, what is the way out? This is one of the way out. What we are discussing here, that here we are doing thermal sensing for coal fire detection and monitoring using satellite based platform and in situ observations. So this is you see the in situ observations we are um, conducting here in the Jiria coal field. Okay. See, this is the thermal imaging camera. There are a lot of uh, these, your, uh, your settings are required for that. So, and this is the monitor. So for this one particular, uh, this cold fire affected area that you can have an image, but uh, while you are imaging, you should be very careful that image should be orthogonal in nature, okay? So we take the image and here we see the beauty of this uh, thermal imaging camera is its pixel size is less than a meter, few centimeters in fact. Now, so this is, this imaging is done, which is few centimeters pixel size. Now in the satellite based observation and this ground based observation. Now, if you integrate together, so see, this is the situation. This is a star thermal image. And this is uh, here, this is thermal image and this is the visible image. So the thermal image by the ground based sensor. Okay. And thermal image by the satellite based sensor, a star and this is thermal image camera. Now you see what the pixel size of 90 meter, what Astar has got, and what is the pixel size of the this thermal imaging camera it is so fine, less than a meters, okay? So you can have much more detailed information about the cold fire. So that is one of the way out. So if we merge this together, we can downscale this pixel size of the satellite based thermal sensors to even uh, a few meters, even up to a meter. Okay, so that is what is the need of the day. Now, what I told you that whatever the present day thermal sensors are there, starting from the very coarse to medium resolution thermal sensors, like advanced very high resolution radiometer or AVHRR. Okay, this is by NOAA is the name of the platform and this is the name of the sensor. So here the spatial resolution is one kilometer or 1000 meter. Similarly, there is the MODIS, Modern Resolution Imaging Spectrometer, MODIS. There are Terra MODIS and Echo MODIS. Okay, Terra MODIS has uh, two uh, orbit in a day, 10.30 and uh, night 9.30. And uh, Echo MODIS has two, again, two orbit in a day, 
so 130 and 130 approximately okay now you have four orbits or modis so you can for the same area you have four orbits so you can have four temperatures for the same area from modis okay but here the pixel resolution is not good it is one kilometer in thermal bands whereas there are a uh, new this thermal mission snpp viirs it is a joint venture of uh, this uh, uh, japan and the us you can see this your joint polar satellite system jps series of spacecraft including this is the uh, sumi national polar orbiting partnership snpp uh, this is a joint partnership of this uh, japan and us okay so here uh, the spatial resolution is 375 meter, but the swath is equally large. Okay, swath is very large means repeatability is very good, as good as this mode is. But your pixel is finer, 375 meter. Now see, these are all coarse resolution sensors. Now Aster is a medium resolution sensor. Okay, Aster is advanced space bond thermal emission and reflection radiometer. Okay, here uh, this sensor has the pixel size of 90 meter. Or spatial resolution is 90 meter and but here there are five bands so five bands so you have multiple channels or multiple multispectral bands so here you can have very precise temperature by split window algorithm then we have landsat 8 and 9 you have two thermal bands one is 10.3 to 11.3 and then is 11.5 to 12.5 micrometer okay these are all the present day available thermal sensors other than this there was landsat tm also tm6 okay now coming to the uh, the future thermal sensing like geostationary satellite over the indian uh, continent subcontinent okay uh, that isro has planned long since is not yet launched but it can be launched in a year or two you see there will be geostationary satellite which will look over the indian uh, subcontinent always continuously because it is a geostationary it is not polar orbiting satellite so every half an hour you will get the thermal image of the, the country but the pixel resolution is 1.5 kilometer that is okay similar to this uh, your uh, modis or so but the beauty is it is observing always and for getting the total image it takes half an hour now there is another future thermal uh, this your mission is trishna the abbreviation Trishna Thermal Infrared Imaging uh, Satellite for High Resolution Natural Resources Assessment. This is a joint venture of India and the, uh, France. Here you see the beauty is Swath is very large, 1026. Okay, but pixel for the land area you see 57 meters, 57 to 90 meters, better than Aster. But Swath is so large. Aster has a Swath of only 60 kilometers. And pixel size here for a deep sea is one kilometer, but for land it is 57 to 90 meter. Here the beauty is its repeatability is very less. Why? Because what is very large. Repeatability is only three days. So every three days you will have the thermal image. That too in 57 to 90 meter spatial resolution. That will be this particular mission. The satellite will be launched maybe in a year or two. Now you see the thermal sensing of volcano and lahar. Okay, you see that uh, if you go for thermal sensing, then you can exactly or precisely you can tell what is the volcanic vent, what is the high temperature point, and this is the volcanic cone, and this is the these lava flow areas, and that is the image in the visible bands. Now, similarly for earthquake studies, thermal sensing can be used as a precursor thermal anomaly. It has been observed that just before the earthquake, a few days back or so, that uh, the temperature of the earth surface very near to the epicenter of the earthquake it uh, increases the temperature from 5 to 10 degrees celsius that has been observed in many earthquakes not just one or two many major earthquakes low magnitude earthquake you may not be able to find it but if the magnitude is high you will be able to get this prominent this precursor of 5 to 10 degree above this uh, normal temperature okay so example if you see in case of this uh, bomb earthquake okay so bomb earthquake occurred in 2003 26 december 2003 that is in iran and this is the location of the epicenter see this 22 december there is no thermal anomaly 
high temperature here 23 there is some higher temperature and 24 you see this is showing high temperature normally 24 and 25 which is very close to the date of earthquake 26 so earthquake occurred 26 and after that there is no more thermal anomaly so this is the temperature rise of 5 to 10 degree it is because of this is a this earthquake and it is it can be used as a precursor of this earthquake okay now as i was telling you it is not observed for a one or two earthquakes but many earthquakes globally it has been observed provided this magnitude of the earthquake is high like here all the earthquakes of above 7 magnitude even up to 8 magnitude it has been observed very prominent temperature rise just before the earthquake in and around the epicenter of the earthquake it has been observed that temperature rise okay now coming to the second part of our lecture that is the radar remote sensing for a geoscientific study so what are the advancement in radar remote sensing there are many advancement but in a very very brief time it will be very difficult for me uh, to um, address all but i will uh, give you an overview okay so for example radar you know radar imaging is an active illumination system that transmits electromagnetic pulses to the ground radially sidewise from the platform and of nadir you can see that from this illustration isn't it of nadir sidewise and radially the back center radar signal is received after a fraction of a second by the receiving antenna okay the signal is then processed to construct a digital image of the ground okay and the wavelength of radar pulse ranges from a few centimeter tens of centimeter for this sidriya radar but as far as microwave region is concerned it is one millimeter to one meter so what you can see here that for radar imaging or synthetic versus radar imaging the wavelength is 10 to the power four times optical and thermal emergency because the wavelength is so large it has certain advantages the major advantage is it can penetrate through atmosphere so during cloudy day you can get a beautiful image which you cannot do in case of uh, in optical remote sensing or thermal remote sensing isn't it and also because wavelength is large it can penetrate through forest it can penetrate through ground so you can have subsurface information and because it is a active uh, sensor so uh, this because you are uh, the from the sensor itself this your electromagnetic pulse is uh, transmitted is it so it is an active sensor so it operates both day and night <clears throat> but it has certain disadvantage like uh, there is a speckle effect produces granularity in the image brightness so speckle noise and geometric distortions like foreshortening layover radar shadow and ambiguity and one more disadvantage is it is insensitive to color and composition of materials but the dielectric properties or electrical properties it is very very sensitive to the electrical properties of the material uh, particularly the dielectric property which is uh, is measure of the free h2o content in the material now see if we try to understand in terms of the geological remote sensing what are the major advantage of this radar remote sensing see it's sensitive to surface geometry provides information on geomorphology and geological structures okay it's sensitivity to surface roughness in non vegetated terrains provides information on lithology and it's sensitive to moisture content provides information on unconsolidated materials and soils particularly alluvium uh, then hydrated uh, these materials or altered mineral deposits and most importantly its capability to penetrate through vegetation and ground it allows to image the vegetation covered terrain so in a forested area you can get the image of the terrain and also you can um, identify the subsurface geological features like buried channel active faults in alluvial terrain and underground civil structures for example water and oil pipelines and sewerage lines now see this the effect of topographic slope from this side this radar is looking so that is why this side looks bright and this is a plateau so it is the top top is flat so there is not much difference in the brightness but on the other side you can see there is the this the brightness is less and in many places uh, this radar 
pulse is not reaching, so you are getting the rendered shadow. See it. Now you see this is a mining area, Jeria Coalfield area. You can see because a lot of open cast mining is happening in this particular belt. And so this ruggedness is very, very high, isn't it? So because of the high ruggedness, so this area, there are a lot of back scattering happens and this area looks very bright. But most importantly, you see the surface roughness is so much highlighted in the in this particular image, isn't it? See here the, uh, the geological features, the carbilinear sandstone ridges are very, very prominent. This is the rail lines you can see. The many other features I'll show in the, the subsequent slides. And this is an image which is a merged product of the optical, multispectral, and the radar image. So here you see how the geomorphological mapping becomes much more easier because optical remote sensing, false color composite gives you the color, the rocks, isn't it? Whereas the radar image gives you the information about the topographic elevation and slope, as well as ground penetration information. That is why geomorphological features like the structural hills, buried channels become so prominent. Similarly, these crater boundaries become prominent and Aeolian landforms like the longitudinal sand dunes become so much highlighted here, isn't it? <clears throat> See, in case of uh, radar remote sensing, one of the important aspects is the polarization of the uh, radar signal, radar pulse. The polarization can be different kind of polarization is possible. This one of the important polarization is the linear polarization. And you know the polarization is decided by the this electrical vector because it is an electromagnetic radiation, no. So electromagnetic radiation is basically the result of the electrical field and the magnetic field. Electrical field and magnetic field, they are um, acting at perpendicular to each other. And this uh, electromagnetic radiation happens perpendicular to the electromagnetic plane. What is electromagnetic electric field? Perpendicular to that is the magnetic field, and that makes a electromagnetic plane. And perpendicular to this electromagnetic plane is the your electromagnetic radiation or the radar pulse is transmitting. Okay. Now the polarization is basically uh, decided by the electrical field, direction of the electrical field. Okay. If it is a linear polarization, it can be horizontal or it can be vertical, isn't it? So if you transmit horizontal, and then up it is transmitted horizontal, and then it is interacting with our surface, then coming back, and again you receive horizontal, then this kind of radar image is known as HH. Similarly, if you transmit vertical, and then after interaction also, it is coming back to the receiving antenna, and you are receiving only vertical, then these are known as VV. So HH and VV are like polarization radar image, and HB and VH are cross polarization radar image. See, HH and VB, they highlight the surface scattering. So surface features are very much prominent. Like in this, uh, this image you see, here these surface features are prominent, all these uh, overburden dams, then the settlements, these features are very much highlighted. Here you see, uh, like overburden dams and settlements, and here the river bridge highlighted, isn't it? And both the images are acquired at the same time. Both you HH and HB, they are acquired at the same time by the same satellite. But one is the HH polarization, another is HB polarization. Now see in case of HB polarization, which highlights subsurface information, okay? If subsurface features will be highlighted, see in this particular area, so prominently you can identify the fault, which is presently covered by the soil and the land use practices like agricultural land. So agricultural land and soil, which does not allow you to see there is a fault underneath. But because this in HV polarization, it can penetrate through the ground, you can get information about the subsurface features at the fault. But here you see the surface features like this bridge, like settlements, like the overburden dumps, these are not visible. As if the bridge is vanished. But it is not, because this particular polarization does not receive that information. Okay. So polarization of the radar wave. A radar image is very, very important. And polarimetric analysis, one of the important aspect of the, um, one of the important advancement in the radar image interpretation. Polarimetric uh, signature, the uh, polarimetric decomposition. Okay, so these are the some newer advancement in the radar remote sensing, which can be meaningfully used for geological studies. But another important aspect is the interferometric SAR. Okay, where the two radar uh, these images we need, Okay, just uh, before and after image, if we 
aquare, like for an earthquake or for a volcano or for a landslide. Here, this example is for a landslide. So if you have an image before the landslide and another image is after the landslide, if you can acquire two images before and after the event. Now, using this phase information of these two images, you can get the phase difference. And from this phase difference, you can measure this. This year, what is the displacement has happened. So this is illustration is very, very important. You can see the response of the terrain uh, due to the landslide has been measured here. It is not due to the major landslide when it happened, but just before the major sliding has happened, before that, when the slow movements are happening, it has measured that. At different time intervals, like three days, six days, nine days, nine days, 12 days, and 15 days, you see different time interval, you can see that the deformation uh, picture is very, very clear. In this case, these three days, each color cycle tells you lambda by two displacement. Lambda by two means 2.8 centimeters. So displacement is maybe around 5.6 centimeter along the radar line of sight. But here you see more number of color cycles because the number of days are more. Here you see even more. Okay. Here it is more, but it is not so clear because there are noise. Okay. But here you see the number of color cycles are more and noise is relatively less. Okay. Uh, because the terrain behaves uh, some better way. But what is the basic thing? that if you increase the number of days, that your correlation will be reduced and there will be more noise. That is why you see in three days, there is less noise. As you increase the number of days, then there are more and more noise. This is an exception. But here, for example, if you see the 15 days, almost it is full of noise, isn't it? I see similar studies we did for this uh, Terry, uh, this your uh, reservoir. So all uh, along this the reservoir rim, there are slow uh, movement you can observe. Uh, it is that uh, this mass of this, this slope uh, material are slowly moving down. Okay. Similarly, in the in case of Nainita Lake, which is a natural reservoir, okay, there also you can find these slow movements, but the direction of movement is different for different places. Now you see red, which is uh, from the radar, it is here and green is towards the radar. So towards and away does not mean that it is uplift and subsidence. What ex actually we use it, but it means that the direction of movement is different. Okay. Now you see there is a one more uh, advancement in the radar uh, remote sensing is not only the satellite based your interferometry, which is very much used for measuring the ground land surface uh, displacement, whether due to landslide, due to earthquake, volcano, or uh, uh, glacier movements, or land subsidence due to mining. Okay, but you can use the ground-based uh, interferometric SAR. This is one of such instrument. It is known as GBSAR, ground-based synthetic aperture radar. Here you can see there are two, uh, these antenna. So you transmit by one from here, for example, and then receive by two antenna, so separated by some baseline. So continuously you can do interferometry and you can monitor that how the land surface is uh, showing some movements or not. Okay. So ground-based interferometry SAR is also possible. Now in case of uh, earthquake like Nepal, for example, so you know that uh, 2015 there was a major earthquake occurred that is 80 kilometer northwest of Kathmandu, isn't it? So here it is uh, magnitude was 7.8 and there are many uh, aftershocks above 6 and then one of the major aftershocks 7.3. For that we have uh, measured by remote sensing based approach we have measured the, what is the land surface displacement, isn't it? So you see here is the uplift and here is the subsidence. Okay, for the ma main shock and it is the major aftershock 7.3, it is the uplift 65 centimeter along the radar line of sight and here is the subsidence 35 centimeter. Similar pattern, but affected area is less. So in fact, there is the main central thrust somewhere here, isn't it? And the total displacement pattern during the total period, before the main shock and for a, a period of one month, which includes all the, uh, these, uh, these uh, after shocks, after this main shock. So main shock and all after shocks together, land surface displacement can be seen here. Now, due to this earthquake, there are a lot of damage occurred in Nepal. That is due to the main shock, and this is the 
uh, main shock and all the aftershocks combined intensity of damage. And this intensity scale is the modified Mercalli scales. And in case of India, there are some areas only affected. Okay, like there is a lobe here, there are some lobe here, there is a lobe here, essentially three lobes. One in and around the West Bengal, one in and around the Bihar, another is the UP. Okay, so Darbhanga Pitiya in Bihar, Jaipur Pajabad in UP, and Jangipur Bhattograi in West Bengal. Okay, then why only this uh, in three lobes? Why not the entire area? That is because the in-situ geological conditions. How much is the sediment thickness? What are the geological structures? What is the this geomorphology? Whether it is the valley or it is the ridge? What is the nature of the rock underneath? Whether it's hard and compact or it is the softer rocks? So all the features, all the characteristics are important. Now this uh, uh, radar interferometry can also be used for uh, this mapping and measuring land subsidence due to mining. Okay, this multi-frequency approach, C band and L band. We have produced this uh, land subsidence map. Then we combined and then compare with the ground based this year map prepared by the labeling and the total system based approach. And this is how we have integrated with this um, campaign mode GPS or uh, campaign mode GNSS and the digital labeling technique. So this is the four locations that we have studied by all these techniques like your interferometry, like your uh, campaign mode GNSS and by the leveling techniques. Then we see the comparative analysis of these results. It is very much comparable. Now coming to this uh, the lands uh, subsidence due to groundwater depletion. So whether groundwater depletion is happening or not, you can get some regional information from the gravity anomaly. And gravity anomaly nowadays you can have from satellite based approach. Gray satellite is a twin satellite impact. There are two satellites, okay, at a distance of around uh, uh, some uh, uh, 200 or something like this. Okay, so twin satellite is measuring this, your, uh, their distance, 200 meter, okay. So uh, that measures this uh, gravity, um, anomaly, basically the dynamic gravity it measures, and using this dynamic gravity, uh, one can assess what is the terrestrial water storage change. And from this terrestrial water storage change, if we subtract this, uh, the surface water storage change and uh, components like vegetation water component or the soil moisture, if we subtract components, then we can water storage change. And this is the, uh, the groundwater level fluctuation based uh, your information that is provided by CGWB. And this is from the GRACE groundwater storage change. This is from the CGWB. And this is what we have prepared in this uh, reprocessing this your grace gravity data and by downscaling with respect to the in situ uh, this your uh, factors including this uh, groundwater level data which is available from settled groundwater board here you can uh, see very clearly uh, this uh, groundwater depletion in some of the areas and in fact these two maps we have produced from the groundwater level fluctuation from central groundwater board pre versus pre monsoon and post versus post monsoon. And here we have shown you the groundwater depletion hotspots, number of locations in Northwest India, like here one is the ground depletion hotspot, there is one other here, okay? There are uh, the, uh, several locations which is showing groundwater depletion hotspots. That means groundwater level is declining consistently. Okay, now you see here, this in uh, several hotspots we have studied, like in Mohali Chandigarh, like in Delhi, like in Gujarat, Study and we have observed the, uh, the definitive uh, land subsidence by this interferometric SART technique, which is a radar based technique. Now, you see, in case of Delhi and city, you show the dynamics of the land subsidence starting from 2003, 4 to even uh, today, and how this uh, land subsidence is changing. There are two locations one near the Dwarka, another near the Kapasara and Gurugram. We have shown this uh, land subsidence dynamics. In Dwarka, it has started in 2003-04, whereas in uh, Kapasera, it started in 2007-08, land subsidence started. And uh, later on in Dwarka, there is no more land subsidence, but there is uplift. Whereas in Kapasera and Gurugram, Gurugram, it is still subsidence is consistently happening. And this is the time series deformation history, okay, of the permanent scatterers. 
and the more, much more precise uh, information about the land subsidence we have shown here. Similarly, in case of Mohali Chandigarh, you can see the groundwater depletion scenario like Ambala, like your uh, Mohali, Lanran, Chandigarh, and this Kharar. You can see the groundwater depletion is very, very prominent. And while we see this land surface uh, performance is happening or not, it is uh, spectacular that there are uh, this very high rate of land subsidence we have observed in Mali area particularly is more than 10 centimeter land subsidence happening in Mali. Chandigarh is much less. It is initially maybe two centimeter per year to presently three to four centimeter, but is Mali and this Ambala, Banur, Kharar, the subsidence rate is quite high. Particularly in Mohali, it is very high. It is more than 10 centimeters per year. And this is the time series deformation history. And because of this land subsidence, there are a lot of damages are happening to the houses and buildings. Similarly, we have studied for the uh, this Gujarat in Mesana area. And in Mesana area, you see, because of the groundwater depletion and because of the oil extraction, there may be land subsidence may be possible. And we have studied that in the center of the city. There are a lot of land subsidence we have observed. But here, what is important that not only the satellite based observation by interferometry, but also by GNSS and labeling based information is very, very important. We need to integrate such information together. And one uh, another important aspect of uh, the radar remote sensing, where the uh, recent advances are happened significantly, that is in the planetary science. See, uh, for example, in case of Chandrayaan 1 and 2, we have radar imaging sensors. We have the SAR data, sensing image radar data. For example, using the Chandrayaan 1, uh, this mini SAR data, we have studied many locations of the moon, like your uh, North Pole, South Pole, near side, far side, and near the equators. Different locations we have studied wherever the data is available. And what we have studied? We have studied these uh, scattering properties to understand the morphology of the uh, lunar surface, particularly what is the surface, what is the scattering properties in the inside the crater, what is the uh, this morphology of the uh, this crater slope, and what is the morphology of the uh, background lunar surface that is where the regolith occurs. And very interesting observation you can see crater center, you can see this is the uh, surface scattering, and blue is the double bounce is very very strong. Isn't it? By the crater floor, you see volumes very prominent. And outside the crater, that means in the regolith, you see this uh, double mounts and volume scattering. And in regolith, there should be volume scattering because it is loose materials. So not only the morphology and surface characteristics, but also we have studied the presence of water ice is there in the uh, deep uh, crater or not. So for that, we have analyzed some of the important polarimetric parameters, but this is compact polarimetric data. So Using the strokes vectors, we have studied this, uh, some of these uh, parameters. We did the polarimetric decomposition, but before that, we first uh, we measured the circular polarization ratio because it is a circular uh, polarimetric data or compact polarimetric data. So CPR we have estimated and degree of polarization. High CPR means there is a possibility of water rise. And low degree of polarization, you can see blue. Low degree of polarization means there is this uh, deposed uh, scattering is happening. Deposed scattering means more volume scattering. Okay, means there is the presence of water ice crystals inside the material. So based on this high CPR and uh, low de degree of polarization, okay, we can interpret that there is a possibility of water ice. Then finally we may go for this polarimetric decomposition, and by this uh, decomposition parameters. We can get much more information about this, this more definitive information about the presence of water ice. Similarly, water ice is also confirmed by these hyperspectral sensors, okay, like MQB in Chandrayaan 1 and IRS in Chandrayaan 2. Now you see there is another possibilities and another advancement in the radar, uh, the remote sensing, that is the radar sounder, particularly for planetary remote sensing, uh, the radar sounder like LRS, lunar radar sounder, in case of moon. And in case of Mars, this is Marsis, which gives you the subsurface information. You see, the, in case of regolith layers, you can uh, visualize the regolith layer so nicely. 
the layers, geometry, as well as if there is any tectonic features are there that you can interpret. In fact, it goes a maximum depth of seven kilometers. So up to seven kilometers, you can have information. Similarly, for Mars also, these kind of studies are being happened now. These are the recent uh, developments or recent advances. So with this, I will conclude uh, this today's lecture. I did a little hurriedly because the two topics I need to do it in uh, just one hour or so, one and a half hour. Uh, so if you have any questions, you will have many questions, I believe. So if you have questions, you can ask me now or you can uh, raise this question later. My email address are given here. There are email address rs at the rate iris.gov.in or rsc.irs at the rate gmail.com. So you can write to me if you have any queries, then I will definitely try to address that query. Thank you.